أضم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا أبا عبد الله الحسين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه Respected brothers and sisters We offer our condolences beginning this podcast to none other than the Imam of our time Imam Sahib al Asr Wal-Zaman and of course the, to the entire Muslim Ummah on the tragic demise of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi his beloved family and companions yesterday we mourned the day of Ashura the skies wept blood on this day the universe cried out for this was the day where none other than Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam the ark of salvation was martyred on the plains of Karbala so we gather now to reflect on this tragic event, to take lessons away from the day of Ashura and to understand how this tragedy can help us move forward in our lives to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course to the Holy Imam alayhi salam, uh, alayhi salam himself as well. Inshallah today we will have a fascinating discussion talking about some of the lessons we can learn from the Holy Imam how we can apply the lessons from him and wider lessons from the religion of Islam into our day-to-day lives as well as of course the introduction and the application of the Holy Quran into our day-to-day lives so as always I welcome my respected co-host Sayyid Ali Radawi Assalamu alaikum Sayyidina How are you keeping yourself? Alhamdulillah, hearts are heavy, but uh, Alhamdulillah, we are still alive and able to go to Majalis and mourn Imam Al Hussein, and this is a blessing from Allah. Subhanahu. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing to be here again with you, Sayyid, and we've, we've, we've had the honor to, to mourn the day of Ashura again, and Alhamdulillah, we have the opportunity to continue with, with the work that we aim to do. And as always, we have another fascinating guest, mm. uh, a good friend, a dear brother. Uh, Montezu Jafar, assalamu alaikum. Wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing, brother? Alhamdulillah, how are you okay, inshallah? Alhamdulillah. 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 Um, Montezu, firstly, it's it's so nice to have you on. I know this podcast took some time to ha- happen finally. For those who don't know, you are, uh, Alhamdulillah, you are a scholar in training, <laughs> a student, honestly, from, mm. from, from uh, the Holy Lands, and uh, right now you are back home. Um, how has your Muharram been? How was uh, the day of Ashura for you? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I think w- a lot of the time when I when people ask me, you're here? And uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm here for the summer. And they say, but you left Muharram over there to come here. Like, what's that about? Mm. Um, I think that there's there's a special charm to doing Muharram in your home. As much as there's a lot of barakah in doing it in the Holy Lands, but there is a special charm to doing it at home. And I find, especially this Muharram, I found that one of the most beautiful things, especially about London, is just the variety of majalis, cultures, languages, um, <clears throat> mourning and spreading the message of Imam Hussein in their very unique ways. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that was, it was just beautiful. And I missed that. <laughs> one thing, so obviously you and I have grown up <laughs> together and one thing for those who know you mashallah you are known as if you don't mind me saying one man majlis <laughs> and you knew i was going to say that and it's because you mashallah are gifted in so many arts of practicing the deen and that could be through quran recitation it could be through majalis and giving lectures uh, your recitations in every language and i mean every single language mm. your spoken word poetry Alhamdulillah, now you are becoming, you're a student of the religion and inshallah we will learn from you in years to come. Um, So we're really honoured of course to have you bro. Um, If you don't mind me asking, when you look back on the last 10 nights and what you expected to gain from the 10 nights going into the Majalis, um, how do you feel looking back on it introspectively in terms of what you've learned? Have you gained what you wanted to gain? How do you feel now? So I think that ties in perfectly to, to what, what we want to talk about today. Um, and I'll answer the question. I think that coming into Muharram, coming into this Muharram especially, there was a huge question in my mind that, okay, say that Ahmed, between the three of us, we've mm. probably heard hundreds of hours of lectures. Some of them awesome. Some of them we loved. Some of them we didn't really like. Some of them we loved and we appreciated the content. Some of them we may have loved the content, but maybe... 
you know, the speaker was, for example, we, we didn't take our boxes. Not that he wasn't a good speaker, mashallah, there's a lot of good speakers out there, but sometimes, you know how it is, we sit yeah. in a lecture, we, because of our uh, shortcomings, fail to connect, right? Okay. So for me, it was about, all right, I'm going here, I'm listening to, for example, 10, 12 hours worth of pure Islamic content from the member. When I go away, am I 12 hours worth of Islamic content closer to God? Or am I exactly the same person that I was? <clears throat> to me, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's a waste of 12 hours mm. if I sit there, listen, and come out exactly the same. The same way it would be a waste of, for example, years of going to the gym. Mm. If after years of going to the gym, you look exactly like you did before. Mm. Right? So I think that fundamentally that was my question going in. And coming out, I guess the only person that can answer that is myself. Um, and, and each and every one of us We're accountable to only ourselves mm. Even your significant other Is not going to hold you to account About that It's going to be you And I think that's the journey Of Islam as a whole How can we reflect? Because Refl you're saying It's down to us I think it comes down to The, the idea of Islam That we have in our heads At the very core You see I think Islam For us Has I'm speaking to myself first, mm. but I think that living in this life, getting caught up day to day, we know that, okay, here's, here's our box, here's our red lines, we're not going to go outside of it. So for example, we won't go drink alcohol. We won't blast music in our car when we're driving down the street. We blast that we are, it's a different story. Okay. We're yeah. not going to blast music when we're driving down the street, mm. right? We have these don'ts, and maybe we have some do's. For example, I pray salah every day, right? Aside from that, Aside from religion being this red lines, these red lines, these parameters that we never cross, in your day-to-day -day life, and I'm, I'm putting this question to you honestly, I, I don't, you don't need to answer on the mic, I just want you to think about it. But aside from that, in your day-to-day -day life, when it comes to how you treat your kids, how you are at home, decisions you have to make in the workplace, decisions you have to make in social circles, every single day, man makes a numerous amount of decisions. Mm. Where does Islam fall in your criteria or in your pros and cons list when you're making a decision it's interesting you say that i'm thinking now i, I think it happens automatic i've never actually thought like if i want to do something what does islam say but say my point is that that automatic realization is yeah. just those parameters okay am i crossing the line am i not crossing i'm not gonna okay i'm good as mm. long as it's not haram for haram. example i'm chilling but why mm. why do we not go further <clears throat> than that my, like are we genuinely happy to be on this basic lowest level of religion mm. after hundreds of hours of lectures that we've sat through and Good listened point. to. That's very, very true. Point, yeah. Right? In, it's very interesting. When you, when you try and introduce the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Even if you're talking to a Muslim, you know when you go out in nature and you see mountains and you see trees and you see rivers, right? You say, subhanAllah, look at all yeah. this. You see this and then you tell me there's no God. What is, according to some reports, what does Imam Hussain say in Dua al Mata ghibta. When were you ever away from me that I needed something to point me towards you? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's not wrong to say, wow, subhanAllah, look at all this and then tell me there's no creator. That's perfect. But when do we take the next step and say, okay, you know what? Allah is here. I don't need to look around me to take me to Allah. Where's that next step? Why do we not push ourselves? That's, that's the crux of the conversation that I want to have today. And I want to delve and dive into that a little bit more. Why is Islam an afterthought yeah. as opposed to our nature? It's not, it's not our primary concern. It's a shame. Do you, do you think it's because a lot of us um, feel like we, we, we live amongst a safety net and we are very comfortable in our circles and in, in our comfort zones of being able to benefit and take from which we enjoy and you know from the multitude of of, of uh, pockets of knowledge that we have access to we pick and choose what we like and we leave it at that and a lot of us don't go above and beyond to gain the knowledge and then to make the effort to apply that into our lives so if, let me give you an example you mentioned the majalis i think for a lot of the community sometimes even including myself I will use majalis as my source of knowledge, which I don't think is correct or sufficient. 
um, because Majalis are there, in my opinion, they should be there for reminders and they should be supplementary to, to the knowledge that I'm gaining myself, the research I'm doing myself. But perhaps sometimes we feel so comfortable in what we have access to, so we do not extend further. And therefore we limit Islam and practice of Islam to the areas in our life where we feel comfortable to practice Islam. And then when I step into, like, like, you, like you mentioned, the workplace, your university, wherever it might be, you become a different person, you assume a different identity, and you, you wear a different hat, and you begin to engage differently to when you are in the Majlis of Muhammad Hussain, alayhi salam, for example. Um, and like you said, sometimes we just consider the wajibat, and we may not consider the mustahabat, and mm. all of the other things, what might be makroor, or even not, not even what's, what's wrong and what's right, but what might be beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are things which are loved by Allah, which are maybe mubah for argument's sake, you know, in the sense of from, from a hukum shara'i perspective, do you get me? So do you think it's perhaps because we don't um, go above and beyond in our own practice of Islam and what we consume of Islam to then apply outside of Islamic circles, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, I think that we stay in our comfort zones, right? But I, taking it one step further, I think that that causes something. And what it causes is that it causes us to become passive in our approach. We take Islam, what we learn from the age of, what, six, five, five, six, up until the age of 17, 18, right? That's where our parents are trying to drill into us. Once you get to 18, 19, 20, you're making your own decisions mm. based on the framework that you've built. So it's yeah. those years that we're consuming this content, this knowledge, right? But after that, what happens is all we do is use that framework going forward in our lives. I don't think we do enough to continue building on that as opposed to just relying on what we've done in those years. So what happens is, in the future years, we start to become very passive. We yeah. start to say, all right, you know what, I have my Islam, I know my Islam, and that's it. But the reality is that passiveness is not enough in Islam. Yeah. And I'll give you an example from the Qur'an, right? I'll ask you right now, answer me this, what is the meaning of Rahmah? Mm. What is the meaning of Rahmah? On mercy. a basic level, I'll say mercy. Mercy. Yeah. Mercy. We all know, it means mercy. What does it mean when we say that we are looking oh Allah is the most merciful mm. it means that we either did something wrong right or we didn't do something right mm. we missed our salah Allah is Rahman Rahim right mm. can you okay. see how that's passive or we did something wrong and we're hoping in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of our lack of action or action in the wrong way we're just hoping in his mercy do you mean because we rely on the lenience of Allah being yeah merciful? we just rely on that Right. But what does Allah say in the Quran? So even to attain this mercy, which is not yours, it's not your doing, it's Allah's mercy that we've been relying on because of our lack of action. But in order to do that, you need to do something. Mm. Obey Allah and the Prophet. It's not passive. You can't just do something wrong or not do something right and then say, yeah, God. God's yeah. forgiving, God's merciful. It doesn't work mm. that way. So the idea of being passive in Islam is not there, right? Everything about Islam is an active endeavor, which, which I think our, us in our communities seem to lack beyond a certain point. Your kids are in the madrasa until the age of what, 16, 17? Mm. What about after that? It's all well, it's amazing in fact. It's not just all well and good. It's really good to be focused on producing the best doctors, the best lawyers, the best engineers, the best pharmacists that the, that the world has ever seen. It's a noble objective, but at what cost? Mm. Right? So I think that it needs to be the case where we build more on that. Because knowing things is not enough. Passiveness is when you take what you know and you just keep it and you rely on it. But is knowledge enough? If knowledge was enough, mm. did Amr ibn al-As not have knowledge about Imam Ali? Mm. Did the people at the time not have knowledge that when the Prophet was speaking about loving his family, he was talking about Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayha. Did they not have knowledge of Imam al-Hussein? They did. But it took hur 
who didn't just have the knowledge to say that I would say the same thing back to you about your mother, but your mother's Fatima says Zahra. He knew mm. it. Mm. But that wasn't enough until he took action on that knowledge and on the day of Ashura, he said, I see myself choosing between heaven and hell. Mm. He can have the knowledge. It's not good enough. So he saw Allah in that moment. Ahsantum. Ahsantum. Mm. He saw what is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me. On a basic level, I know this is the son of Amir al and Fatima says Zahra. Mm. I know. That's why I told my army to pray behind him. That's why I couldn't respond in kind when he told me, Thakalatka Ummuk. I couldn't say it back because I know. Mm-hmm. But until the morning of the 10th, he was destined for the hellfire. Do you think it's, uh, there's, there's an element of uh, ma'rafa on this? So, knowing in the case of Hur, um, as an example, Knowledge of the Imam from a descriptive and an aesthetic level is one thing to know his, you know, his family lineage, to know his status in the Ummah and whatnot. But Ma'rafa of the Imam will extend beyond that. Of course, the enemies of the Imam knew the status of the Imam. They knew how they were related to Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, for example. But the Ma'rafa of the Imam kind of acted as the catalyst for her to make that decision. And in the same way, for us in our in our kind of predicaments and our dilemmas that we face on a daily basis, ma'rafa of our present imam will perhaps, you know, encourage us to make the right call, to make the right decision as well. Um, and I, I just want to ask you something as well, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but ma'rafa of the imam is one thing, but of course we know that when we always talk about hadith thaqalain and the relationship that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had with the Holy Quran was so unique mm. on so many levels, whether it's in his biography prior to Karbala when he would bring the Quran into his life. He, there, I, I, I read a story a couple of days ago about how the Holy Imam actually got a teacher for his children to teach them Surah Al Fatiha, not that he couldn't. But he wanted to inc- show the community that you should invest in things like that. And he would overpay and overcompensate the teacher for his children to show them that the Quran was of such great status. But beyond that as well, obviously, we know from, from the maqatil that the Imam wanted an extra day so he could spend the night in worship and prayer, reading the Holy Quran. All the last words he uttered were the words of the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors him in Surah Al-Fajr, which is the Surah of Imam Hussein, we, of the verse behind me. You know, we talk about Nafs al Mutma'inna in Surah Al Fajr. Yeah. There's so many verses uh, before the podcast, we're talking about the Huruf al Muqatta'at, you know, Kaf Ya Ain Saad. Like, there's so many parallels to draw between the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. Um, Ma'rafa of the Imam is, I think, is so important. But is there, is there an, uh, like an equivalent when it comes to Ma'rafa of the Holy Quran? I think there definitely is. Um, I think that. The Quran is almost the missing piece of the puzzle sometimes. Like we mm. we have so much respect for the Ahlul Bayt that it seeps into our everyday life sometimes. Like look at us right now. We're all wearing black. We're not wearing black because we chose to color coordinate. We're wearing yes. black because we have an affinity towards Imam Hussein that mm. seeps into our life come the time of his commemoration. We're wearing black because we know in Muharram, we are in a state of grief. There are certain communities, and I'm sure you've come across them as well as I do, they do not do certain things during the 10 days of Muharram. Yeah, they refrain. Out of respect, mm. they refrain. Some people don't get haircuts. Some people don't play football. Today I was speaking to, some, to a brother who told me, like the, there, was, there was a couple of brothers having a conversation, and they said, um, he's signing up for football. And he goes, it's the first 10 days of Muharram. I'm out. It's... It's not disrespectful to play football, but because he has this level of knowledge that I am in the state that I am in right now, I do not want to do this because I am in this grief, mm. right? So there is that and it seeps into our daily life, alhamdulillah. As well um, as a sign of respect. Exactly. That exactly. I think we were lacking towards God in other places in our life. Ahsantu. Yeah. Ahsantu. How many people do we know mm. when it comes to a wilada, they buy their kids ice cream? When it comes to a fat, they tell their kids, okay, listen, yeah. no TV today. Because mm. we're, we're, we are in this household, we are commemorating. Mm. So it does seep into our daily life. What about the Quran? Mm. What happens there? Quran comes, kids come, sit down, here's your ayah that you're on today, two ayahs, close the Quran, we're done for today. Right? And 
partially I think that and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong but from my experience I've seen a, a, almost a fear of getting close to the Quran right if I told if you didn't know anything about Islam and you don't know anything about the Quran and I told you that listen your life as a human is going to come with tests and trials and tribulations it's gonna happen. You're gonna lose things. Mm-hmm. We're gonna test you. Bishayim min al khawf, fear, ju' hunger, and loss. Yeah. Loss of what? Mal, people, the your your whatever you've earned, you're gonna lose it. We're gonna test you. We will. Right? But if I told you that there's a book somewhere, go go to this library, pick up this book from the bookshelf. I'm telling you, read it, read it properly, read it carefully, it'll have all the answers you'll ever need. It doesn't sound real. Like to someone who's not been exposed to this. That's because we haven't read it. Exactly. But it, it, mm. The concept of it is so abstract yeah, to yeah, the yeah. outside world, it yeah. does not sound real. Sahih, sahih. Right? There's, there's no such thing as an instruction manual for life, except there is. Right? So there's this fear of getting into it because it's like, the more I get in, the more I'm going to take out. But what if I can't handle what I take out? Right? But the answer is that, well, my, my, my honest thoughts are that the Quran, there is no rule against you delving into the Quran on your own. Mm. It's not like understanding the Quran is conditioned on there being a scholar to teach it to you. Yeah. Baba, open the Quran, read one verse, reflect on it a little bit. Take what you can from it. If you take that thing, implement it in your life. There's no barriers between you and the Quran. I think we need to stop acting like there are. Because that's going to take us further away from the Quran. Right? Um, and I think it also goes back to understanding that none of these things can work in an abstract. You can't understand the presence of God in an abstract without having the Quran in your life. You can't have the Quran in your life without having the Ahlul Bayt in your life. You can't have the Ahlul Bayt in your life, but then forget the Quran and leave God doesn't work. These things come all together as a holistic package to make the perfect religion. And who the hadith of Thaqalain makes it clear that they do go hand in hand. They will never separate. Mm. You will never go astray and they will never separate until Kawthar. Mm. Right? So the Quran is like really the key to this. And to show that they're interlinked. You just have to look at the life of Imam Hussein and then go back to the Quran and see that, bro, these two are like, it's like reading the life of Imam Hussein in a book. Mm. In the Quran. So, yeah. They do go hand in hand. I, I, while you were talking, I was remembering a conversation I had with a friend many years ago, by the way. This memory just came back now. And we were, like, we were having a combo between each other. Like, why are we really not into our Quranic recitations, Quranic readings? Like, why are we slacking so much? And my friend said something very interesting. He, he said, the more I read the Quran, the more I feel like I have to become more religious. So I, I'm happy where I am. And it goes back to the point you were mentioning earlier where we just want to do the basics and nothing more. But I think we have to do more. Yani if we've just come out from the majalis of Muharram. Yani we have to stop this business where we say, Quran is just before the majlis. A Quran is just Ayatul Kursi if we're traveling. A Quran if it's a relative that's passed away. We have to really no, connect and understand it no, full wrong. well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and why? Like I remember now I was reading the other day the, the wasiyah of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam to his sons, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, where he references well, the Quran. Quran. Yeah. And, and he says, make sure this message, whoever reads it, implements it as well. Mm-hmm. Like there's an emphasis. On the Quran that we should learn from. If we say we are Shia Amir al Mu'mineen, if we say we are Husseini, no, Habibi, they stood with the Quran. Yeah. Everything was Quranic about them. Mm. Imam Ali was Quran and Nataq. And do you know what, Said? Even just to add, like a lot of the time, like, we, uh, some, of, some of us, unfortunately, and I think coming back to the point of understanding mm. the Imam and what he stood for and, and what happened before, during, and now in these days after Karbala. Everything ties in with Allah's Qadr and the mission of the Imam hand in hand with the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, some of us, when we attend Majalis, we, we unknowingly do it for selfish reasons. So we will go and we will look for enlightenment. We'll go and we'll look for healing and, and whatnot. Even then, on that level, that's okay. Because I think, like you said, Allah is Arhamar Rahameen. In Surah Al-Isra, Allah says, 
وننزل وننزل مع القرآن ما هو شفاء if I'm not mistaken we sent down the Quran as a shifa and a mercy to those believers and the idea being is that we we are able to gain that shifa from the Holy Quran because for mm. our spiritual diseases and for the things that we look for in terms of afia and contentment and and uh, tranquility in our hearts the tranquility that Imam Hussein had when he lost his life and he returned to his Lord as a contented soul who was pleased with Allah and Allah was pleased with him. Mm. A lot of that can be found, if not all of that can be found in the Holy Quran because he was the embodiment of the Holy Quran. He is the son of revelation. Absolutely. And everything that we learn from his life was done in such a way where he followed the Quran in his day-to-day -day actions. And he lived by the Quran. It's We're doing a disservice to the Holy Imam. If we if we claim to be his Shia and we have no relationship with the Holy Quran, it's, it's, you know when they say that the Ahlul Bayt was the Quran al Natiq or the Imam Ali was the Quran al Natiq, right? Mm. If you look at it from the perspective of somebody who fourteen hundred years later is trying to follow this path, it almost fits in like a flow chart, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has revealed the Quran, huden lin nas, right? That's what the Quran is. It's a guidance for mankind, right? So we have that. So we know that, okay, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He's revealed the Quran. Okay? Then we read the Quran and we say, alright, you know what? This stuff is it's useful, but it's heavy. How does it apply to me? What can I do in my daily life? Where do you look? You look to the Imam alayhi wasalam and how they live their life. Because they are the talking Quran. That book, that hudan lin nas, is them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We always we, we get hung up on these conversations of Imam Ali in the Quran. Where is Imam Ali in the Quran? Where is Imam Ali? They're there. I'm not saying they're not there. Yeah. But when do we stop to look for the Quran in Imam Ali? Ahsad. Where do we stop to look for the Quran in Imam Hussein? You look at these people and you see that these people are living the life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set out for us to live in the Quran. And I'll give you one example. There is in the Quran, in black and white, a formula for achieving success. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ It is absolutely simple. You will never achieve success. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ In the future, you will never achieve success. Right? When we're talking about, we're talking about success, we're talking about money. Yeah, no finances. Cars, we're yeah. not talking about that. We're talking about the real, true <laughs> meaning of success. So, not only if you, if you go into the tafasir, there's definitions of birr. Right? How bir comes from bir. Well, there's huge definitions of bir. So not only has Allah given us success and what it means, but He taught us how to do it. Hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibun until you give from that which you love. love. What did Imam Hussein do when it came to protecting the religion? Name me one thing he didn't give. Hmm. <laughs> What's money? Imam Hussein was holding his six-month-old child in his arms. Gave he gave it. He gave it. He gave it. Let go. And then what did he say? It's easier. What is there upon me, what's happening upon me is easy for me because it's under the eyes of Allah. Which is also in itself, that statement in and of itself is another living manifestation of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We said this ayah, We'll test you with everything. Hunger. Um, fear, loss of children, loss of livelihood, everything. But what did he say after that? وَبَشَّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ give, good, give glad tidings to the patient. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ When tragedy befalls them, what did they say? قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهُ إِنَّا لَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Yes, those words are in the Qur'an. But the fundamental principle of it is that when it befalls you, the first thing you do is you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person's lost his whole family, he's lost his children. He knows that as soon as he dies, these enemies are going to come and they're going to set fire to the tents and they're going to take his women captive. But he takes a moment to say that whatever's happening on me is easy. Why? Because you're watching. Because it's under your eyes. To make Allah the center of your life like that, now compare that to us, to me. Where I'm saying in this day and age that, you know what, I'm happy where I am with my Islam. I don't drink, I don't listen to music, I'm happy. What are we doing? Where are we going? Right? We need to push ourselves that little bit more. What would you say are a few practical tips 
we can we can do to achieve this because i know many listening I, myself included is like okay i want to do more and uh, two weeks ago me and ahmed had an episode where like there's more we can learn from ashura from from karbala there has to be more what can we do i think one of the things is that we need to i heard this once in a, in, a, in a talk we need to stop reverse engineering with the quran the likes of yourselves who are very active in the community right you know this more than I do That a lot of the times in the community We go We find something to do We find an initiative We find a project And then when it comes to launching it in the speech We'll be like alright What does it say in the Quran about this? Where can I find the ayah To put in the beginning of my speech To show people that what I'm doing okay, yeah. Is part of mm. like, It's in the Quran It's in the hadith we're trying to make the Quran fit us. Yes. Go look at yes, the Quran. Yes, 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 look yes. at the Quran. Read the Quran a little bit. Yeah. Sit down. Think about it. And say, you know what? Here is a gap. And it's what the Quran is saying. Let's go there. Mm. Then your whole foundation is based on the Quran. Not mm. only that, but you, and I guarantee you, the scholars will tell you more than I will. The students of knowledge will tell you more than me. That when you start looking at one part of the Quran, mm. It will lead you to that part That will lead you to that part That will lead you here That will lead you there yeah. Like just today In the conversation we've had The amount of like Quran Riwayat That are there You were talking about Ma'rafa Right The baseline of Ma'rafa is what Man arafa nafsahu Faqad arafa rabba When a person knows himself He knows What he worships And therefore he knows his Lord it Doesn't say Man arafa nafsahu Faqad arafa Allah it said he knows who his Lord is yeah. because you know yourself. What does it say about that in the Quran? Mm. Have you seen that person who has taken his desires to be his Lord? If you know yourself, you know who is it that you revere and who is it that you worship. And is that Allah? If it's not, we need to recenter. Do you see what I'm saying? You open up a conversation about the Quran. You open up a conversation about the Ahlul Bayt and link it to the Quran, you will go from here to there to there to there. Before you know it, your knowledge will be expanding. But like we said, knowledge is not enough. Mm. It's not enough. Mm. What I would say is, Sayyid, to, really? answer, to answer the question, is that we need to start reading the Quran a bit less like a book that was revealed 1400 years ago and a bit more like Actually like an instruction manual When you go to Ikea And you buy a shelf You don't sit there and recite the instruction booklet While the shelf is rotting away there Mm. You read it Step one Take the screws and put it in these holes Oh but you pick up the screws You screw it in the hole Shout out to Ikea (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what I mean? You don't just sit there That's so true So we need to start picking up the screws Yeah And putting them Mm. in the holes I love it I love that analogy Yeah Absolutely In the next three four weeks obviously in the build-up to Arba'in um, a lot of us will try our hardest to keep up momentum I think this is probably something on the minds of a lot of people um, who have now concluded the 10 10 days the 10 nights and who are trying their hardest and obviously the day after Ashura for a lot of us is probably the hardest because that's the day where you are emotionally physically spiritually Arguably exhausted You're shattered and drained And we all know the feeling After you've cried for hours and hours and hours Especially on the day of the Maqdal You are physically drained The day after In your mind There is a waswasa Saying Now you can relax Ashwana is done You've you've done your musiba You've cried Now you can relax a bit You don't have to wear black all the time you don't have to stop joking and do you know what I mean? Mm. You can start to go back to your old ways. This of course we know is wrong, but the, it's an uphill battle in essence. And keeping the momentum between now and Arba'in, and of course Arba'in should be on par. Of course, we had an amazing lecture from uh, Sayyid Abdullah Naqib, of course, who was on last week on After Maghrib. He mentioned in one of his lectures about the five sides of the believer, one of which of course is Yad Arba'in. And the ziyarah of Arba'in, which we are inshallah looking forward to, is so pivotal for us. So we should now be aspiring to reach there and to be in a better place to where we are now. How do we not only just sustain where we are, but improve on where we are? Because now we have 40 days. 
We have 40 days. This is amazing. We have 40 days as opposed to the 10 we've just had to continue the progress, to continue the search for knowledge and understanding ourselves before understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding our holy Imam. How do we continue that to the point where we arrive at the point of Arba'in, the ziyarah of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and present ourselves to the Imam in his service to say, I have I have made it this way. I've come this far and I'm at your service, your, your absolute service. Mm -hmm. And service to the Imam is service to Allah. And service to the Imam of our time is service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we get to that stage? That's, I think for me, is probably my biggest question. So I think that we need to analyze what happens once we feel drained. I think it's, it's completely normal, it's completely human to finish the 10 nights of Muharram and collapse, right? Mm. Especially, especially when I know these volunteers that work so tirelessly, right? Come the 11th day of Muharram, they're drained. Yeah. Physically, they're finished. I don't blame them. What happens after that? The question for me would be, once I'm drained, where am I getting my strength back from? Mm. What is my motivation? If I get my strength back from lounging around, watching Netflix, relaxing, taking my mind completely away from Muharram and Imam al Hussein and everything that I've heard and the Majalis and the Husseiniyah, I need to question myself. Yeah. But if I, again, physically take a day, recuperate, right? I'm not saying finish the 12th of Muharram, I'm 13th, I want you back in the Husseiniyah, back on the pots, stirring the Qaymah. No, it doesn't need to be like that. But where do you get your strength from? What it sh what, the ideal world? Again, we're not living in an ideal world, but the ideal world, in my eyes, and something that's, you see, it has to be sustainable. Because the last thing you want is for you to be on this high-powered steam train until Arba'in. You land in Heathrow, get back to your house, and you're dead for the next year until the yeah. next Muharram kicks in. Mm -hmm. That's not what we want. We need to implement sustainable changes such that throughout the year, we can continue this, right? So I would say that for someone like myself, who's, who's quite weak-willed in that way, right? What we do is, what, what I would do is, and again, this is very, like, this is like going down to the nitty semantics of how to do it. Everyone can have their different approaches, but this is, this is my honest opinion. Once you're drained, right? Take a day, recuperate, fine. Then think back. People like me only go to one masjid a day. But I know there are people out there that do two or three a day. Mm. Right? Sahih, yeah. That's two, yeah. three hours of solid content. Right? Take one. One lecture. Right? Two times 12 is 24. Let's say you've gone to two a day. You've heard 24 lectures. Or even two times 10, 20 lectures. Right? Take one of those lectures. Actually internalize it. Live it. What did the speaker say on this day? Why did it resonate with you so much? You know, I once heard a person say that if you felt attacked by a lecturer who's lecturing then you need to go back and be like yeah you know, don't start Look blaming the speaker why are you attacking yeah, yeah, yeah. me oh but he's not attacking you he's talking about advice if i have what the advice, I have the advice. Why, is it, why is it offending me There's he's something... talking about ghibah. Yeah. okay i do riba like it's my bad mm. i need to change it don't attack the speaker mm. he's mm. doing his job very true right the the point is take that one lecture internalize it why did it strike a chord with you why, did, why is that the one that's stuck in your head? Maybe it's because that one that was the one you found most relevant to you and that's what you need to change. Mm. Right? And work on changing that. Every two weeks, every month, take another lecture. By the next time, there'll be more lectures come out. Take it, use it. Follow your favorite speaker. Just take something to take you to that next step. But make it sustainable. Mm, that's, my, that's my honest my honest approach would be this that's that's a beautiful advice and i think it's one i can implement now because i'm thinking you're right you know i i can consume hours of lectures a week yani outside of Muharram, yeah, yeah, yeah. i can literally listen to two three lectures a week at minimum um and i have forced myself that's so i can learn something <laughs> or I, I want to be up to date with the series they're doing for example but that means i took that initiative to do that and i can do that similar thing with the quran for example but what I want to focus on is something that you mentioned earlier. Like, it's, it's very similar to Ramadan. It's like Ramadan, we build up spirituality. Eid comes, and then somehow everyone has a freedom pass. Like, 
we're back to normal, everyone's back to square one. We even see, for example, those who became so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of a sudden, you're like, crash land. 24 hours ago, yeah. you were praying Salat al-Layl and now you're missing every single prayer throughout the day. So I think we have to take some accountability of what is it that we want from God? What is that relationship? Is that relationship fair of his hellfire? Or is that relationship worthy of him being worshipped? Because there's so much questions. We need to, I need to, and I'm having thoughts in my head right now I don't want to share because there's so much I need to improve on in my own life. Um, but one thing I would say is that I don't think, to add to your point, Habibi, that I don't think we have been able to structure our lives to allow God to enter it. Because I'm not going to blame distractions for everything, but we don't know how to divide our time. Yani we spend perhaps eight, some people do 12 hour shifts a day. You come home, there's no time for your family, let alone to Allah. I say it, I want to zoom out. I okay. want to zoom out even more. Mm -hmm. You're saying there's no time to split your life. God shouldn't be one of the categories. No, I think it should. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. And I, and I base that based on a hadith by Amir al Mu'minin mm -hmm. where someone asks him, How do I spend my day? And he said, You should divide it into three, three parts. One, one third is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is towards earning a living, if I'm not mistaken. And the third is enjoy what's halal to you. Okay, so, so I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. God should be one of, let's say God should be one yeah. of. Sorry, I wasn't disagreeing. No, no, no. I wasn't. <laughs> but my point is that if just because we keep him in one part doesn't yeah. mean he is not present in the other parts. Mm. I think that's what we need to work on. I, I, I think that, alhamdulillah, 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 I'm, I'm proud of our communities to say that salah is held in very high regard in our communities. Right? Ahmed, you and I grew up together, like you said, we know this. We go play sports on a Saturday night, there will be a hard stop come salah time, whatever is happening. Yeah. We'll sit down, we'll pray, then we'll go back to the game. Right? But my point is that if we section off our time and we dedicate, okay, family, this, mm. that, whatever it may be, and we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in there, all well and good, that should be extra. Mm. The idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be the bedrock of our entire life, whether it's university, whether it's school, whether it's work, there should always be this constant remembrance of Allah. And when we say dhikr, I don't mean subhanAllah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. No, no, no. That's not what I mean. That you see God in all your actions. And exactly. Mm. I think it's also about making ordinary things. Or being when more I said, conscious, I think. Yeah. Exactly. When I said earlier, I don't know if, if, I, if I made myself clear, but when I said sometimes things that are mubah are sometimes beloved by Allah. But I mean, for example, like when you eat, you can make eating an ordinary thing thing activity or well, you can turn it into an act of dhikr. Godly act, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what i mean you think about the etiquette of eating you talk you say you say your bismillah the the halal and and the haram obviously that goes without saying but also overeating thinking about hadith thinking about the etiquette of eating from rasulullah uh, peace be upon him and his family but like there are so many different ways of engaging with something in your day-to-day -day life one thing which i bring up a lot on the podcast is like in my work life and the way i speak to clients and the way I react and when I have a client who is rude to me on the phone and how I react or when I, when I hang up the phone, how I keep myself calm. When I quote a client, am I ripping them off? I've told you this example so many times. But making something which is ordinary yeah. part of our day-to-day -day life yeah, or part of our, our, our relationship with Allah. Just two, two small things to mention. One that really stuck with me when I heard it. Right, There was a lecturer once who mentioned that you know how every time we um, we come close to something significant. So, for example, we're driving, and uh, you know, about to change lanes, and all of a sudden you see a car, whoosh, yeah, come right past you, and you swerve and you stay in your lane. Yes. Right. What's the first word that comes out of your mouth? Yeah, Ali. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We remember God there. Yeah. When you go home and you tell your family, they're like. Bro, God saved you. Mm. Baba, when there's not been the last hundred journeys I've had, we've not had a near miss, who saved me all those times? Mm. <laughs> it's yeah. not been me. <laughs> That's a reality check, yeah. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me every time I drive. It's not just mm. when I have a near miss that Allah says, Yeah, you know what, bro? <laughs> Come here. It's not your time. He's saving you every time. Mm. God is ever present in your life. That 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 is what we really need to wake up to. Right? Um, and I think that once we have that realization that at the crux of it one that this is the second point that i wanted to share that one of the practical ways of remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that you do 
whether it's sitting down to eat, whether you're starting the car for a journey, whether it's after a long journey and you've reached that place, just remember, were it not for Allah, mm. were it not for Allah, what would happen if at any single point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his mercy off me, mm. took his gaze off me, I would cease to exist. It's not just about, I would cease to have the money I have in Baba, you would not be there. Mm. Not, not that mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't bless you extra. If he turns away from you for a millisecond, you're mm. gone. You're nothingness. You know those people that um, are on life support machines, right? You've seen in, in these comedy movies sometimes, right? Someone's on a life support machine, the guy needs to charge his phone. He goes to the yes, plug, takes, out the, takes plug. out the life support machine, plugs in his phone, realizes what he's done, goes back and plugs in the life It's too late. Mm. If we remove that plug, if that plug is removed for a second, the guy's gone. Right? This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be in our lives. This is how we need to internalize and genuinely understand the fact that if it were not for Allah, and that's why that's why I keep using this catchphrase. Because all you have to do is sit down at the table and just have that thought for five seconds. If it were not for Allah, Send. what would happen? Send. That's how to a practical tip of how to Genuinely make yourself aware of Allah in every situation that you find yourself in. Sounds. thank you so much, bro. It's been a pleasure. You've, you've thank been you so much. Truly enlightening, and I I could not thank you more. I think this is the right conversation. I'm sure you'd agree. Yes. Conversation yes. we needed to hear after these ten nights to help us uh, reflect on on so much that we've just experienced in terms of knowledge, in terms of. Uh, morning um, so thank you so much and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to give you tawfiq in everything you do the khidmah you do the knowledge you're gaining and seeking and sharing of course with the people around you and for you to always always be counted amongst the ones who receive the intercession of Abu Abdullah Hussein al Islam in dunya and akhirah may you always be granted the ziyarah of Imam Hussein al Islam and may you be raised amongst the ones who are alongside him inshallah yeah, uh, just just a quick note to also pray for the tawfiq of all the speakers who have been like, said, over the last 10 nights hundreds if not thousands of people have been traveling the world to spread the message of Abdullah um, some of them we know of some of them most of them we don't know of um, traveling to big communities small communities popular places remote places um, whoever they are wherever they are May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase them in all their tawfiqat and accept all their services, inshallah. Asantum, asantum. Thank you so much. I hope it's not the last time we have you on. <laughs> inshallah. inshallah again. It'd be my pleasure. Inshallah, inshallah next we see you on the pulpit sharing this <laughs> knowledge, inshallah. 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 <laughs> Say it over to you. Um, you know, what was our, yani we go way back just before we end. Yani we've been majalis together. We've been different communities together. I've seen you recite on the pulpit. I've seen people uh, have recitations from your own spoken word poetry. And now it's nice to see you also as a student of knowledge. This is an encouragement, inshallah, not just for me and for other people out there that everyone can pursue knowledge. Like, don't take it little. Yani, don't think of it, oh, no, it's only for those who go on the pulpit. No, anyone can do it. And inshallah, it's a lesson where we can say, you know what? If we say we're Husseini and we say we're Shi'i and we say, you know, we, we are holding on to the Thaqalain, that pursuit of knowledge is to always be there Absolutely. and not just learning it, but implementing it. And one thing I had in mind just before I end is that one thing that helps me at times, and I do this with my children all the time, is when they ask me a question, can I do this or can I do that? If I know it's wrong and they don't know it's wrong, I would say, what do you think Allah wants? And then they will try to answer it from a very innocent uh, point of view of, okay, no, maybe God doesn't like that because it may be something that shaitan likes. Like, that's the mindset that have, they have as little children. And I think as adults, we can do better than that. And, you know, does this act please Imam and Mahdi? Does it displease Imam Mahdi? These are questions which yeah. inshallah ask our um, Okay, guys, inshallah, we will be back next week. Um, so stay tuned and continue to support. And I, I also just want to thank all of you on behalf of the whole team here for engaging, mm. sharing, um, commenting and praying for us as well. I, we've received so many amazing kind and warm messages over the last uh, couple of weeks. So thank you so much. We'll be back next week and make sure to spread the word. We'll see you then. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.